Hello and welcome to Cool Time Life. I'm your host, Steve Prentice. Boy, it's annoying when things don't load at the speed you want them to, isn't it? I mean, when we have to wait around for Microsoft Word to fire up or for your browser to configure its updates or for an app to download to your phone. And this is a serious problem. People have a tolerance of mere seconds before they give up and move on to something else. E-commerce people know this, which is why they place such a high priority on solving shopping cart abandonment issues, and music companies know this too, which is why artists are asked to write tunes to deliver the hook sooner. Consumers know they have a choice, and they will move on quickly. So imagine what it must have been like 300 years ago. Imagine, for example, you walk four hours into town, maybe two hours if you're rich enough to own a horse, and as luck would have it, a ship has just arrived, carrying, among other things, mail from the old country. This includes a letter from your BFF, your sweetie, your betrothed, who writes, basically, we need to talk. You reread the letter several times. Your heart is pounding as you see your happy future dissolving before your eyes. You run to the local apothecary and borrow a quill pen and a bottle of ink, and you frantically write back a heartfelt plea to save your relationship. You proofread your letter, you dab the ink dry, you seal it inside an envelope, you dash down to the dock, leaping over barrels and boxes, you dash up the gangplank, and you hand your letter to the first officer you see. Two weeks later, the ship leaves the harbor to start on its two-month voyage back across the Atlantic, where your frantic letter might stand a chance of getting into the hands of your betrothed maybe another month after that. If, by any chance, you're listening to this podcast in Australia, just multiply all of these travel times by ten. Back then, you had to have a lot of patience when it came to sending and receiving information. Did you know, by the way, that one of the contributing factors to the loss of life during the sinking of the Titanic had to do with the fact that the radio operators of the time were employees of the Marconi Wireless Telegraph Company? They were subcontractors, essentially not crew. And as such, their primary responsibility was managing messages between passengers and their families and friends in Europe or in New York. These radio operators had no time or motivation to pay attention to the frantic calls of icebergs ahead from the lookouts. So over the centuries since the Titanic's sinking, our communications technologies have increased in speed and reach, and so have our desires to stay ahead of them. Nothing is ever fast enough. We humans thrive on communication. Today, for example, if someone does not answer your email within five minutes, you consider it within your rights to send another email that asks whether they received your first email. So what's wrong with that, you ask? Well, nothing really, so long as you stay in control of the messaging, but most of the times we find ourselves not in control. For example, it is very difficult to resist the temptation to reply to a text message while you're driving your car. The compelling need to know what an incoming message says and to respond overrules the logic of maintaining control over the vehicle. Evidence continues to mount that shows that even talking hands-free, whether you're chatting on the phone or dictating a text, is still an impairment. It takes a great deal of concentration to drive a vehicle, and that quickly gets eclipsed by the moment-by-moment activities of speaking and listening. So, okay, you say, why isn't it the same when you have someone in the car with you? Well, having a conversation with someone in a car can be distracting, especially if things get heated like in an argument. But when somebody is in the car with you, they can see what you see, and they are more likely to put the conversation on hold if there is a potentially dangerous situation unfolding up ahead. When a vehicle is traveling at 90 feet per second, that's a lot of ground that can be covered during a moment of distraction. They can see that. But the person you're talking to through your phone cannot. The main reason why I'm pursuing this line of thought right now has to do with the bar of expectation, which continues to rise along with that increasing speed of communication. This rising bar does not just apply to messaging, it also applies to our own expectations of ourselves, and this anticipation of increased productivity sometimes exceeds our own abilities. Let me give you an example. When I talk to my audiences about techniques for improving productivity, I deliver this offer paired with a challenge. My offer is this. I say to them, I have, in the trunk of my car right now, a supply of time management spray. You spray it all over you, and it will help you do everything faster. In fact, one spray of this patented elixir, and you will get at least four more hours worth of stuff done. Would you like some of this? Now, honestly, nobody really actually believes I have this spray in the trunk, but they do play along, nodding their heads. After all, the truth is, 
There are very few people out there who would pass up on the chance of being able to get a few more hours of productivity in the day. But wait, I then say like an old-time sales barker, if you were to purchase this spray from me, even at this giveaway price of just $9.99 a can, and if you were to spray it all over you and you found yourself working at super speed, my question would become, what will you do with this time that you have found? Will you use it to answer more emails or attend more meetings? If so, my friends, you have won back nothing. You will simply call me back two weeks from now and you'll be asking for the extra strength spray. This is the problem with best practices generally. They are not able to stick to the surface of a fast-moving culture in a way that ensures ongoing achievement. Instead, they become part of the new normal. So, where once you were able to do five things in a day, okay, now you can do ten. The bar of your expectations rises with this achievement and soon your expectation is that you can and should be able to do 15 things. And once you discover you are able to do 15, you start to expect to be able to do 20 things in a day and you start to make promises accordingly. However, your body and mind have a hard time keeping up with this. Our instinctive desire to evolve and continue to make life better and safer for ourselves enthusiastically grabs this idea of doing more with less time, but our physical and mental selves really cannot do that. So, you say yes to more and more emails, meetings, requests, and tasks. Or more precisely, you don't actually say yes, but you don't know how to say no. No is one of the smallest words in the spoken language, but it's one of the hardest to pronounce. Most of us have a profound fear of confrontation or of offending or angering the person we are communicating with. After all, if you say no to your boss or to your customer, you might lose your entire livelihood. But the fact is, without that capacity to say no appropriately, the work simply piles up. But time does not expand to accommodate. The extra strength spray just does not work. That's why, when it comes to looking at the future of work, many experts and prognosticators all point to soft skills as the key. Skills like prioritization, delegation, and negotiation will become even more critical as timelines continue to shorten and the bar of expectation continues to rise. I'll give you an immediate example. Slack. Now, I love Slack. I am a devotee of online collaborative environments and I use them every time I am managing a multi-person project, which is all the time. There are other brands as well, of course, and Microsoft Teams will likely be the one most people encounter first, given the preponderance of Microsoft products in most workplaces. Long story short, collaborative conversations grouped into channels are far more efficient than email ever could be. There is an informality and an immediacy to the communication that removes much of the mental overload and delay that email has been proven to cause. But the pushback I get from people when they see a collaborative environment for the first time is, well, how is this any different from email? What is the difference between having a pile of unread emails in your inbox and a pile of unread messages in your Slack channels? This is true. Even though I still think collaborative messages can be handled more easily and more quickly overall, there is still an expectation that people be ready and available to respond to messages of any sort the moment they come in. The bar continues to rise. But that's where soft skills come in. There is an ever-increasing need for people to be able to push back and say no in the most practical ways possible. No does not mean go away, I never want to see you again. It means let's negotiate. It's a way of saying, let's find a suitable alternative to the immediate. So whether you choose a collaborative environment like Microsoft Teams or Slack, or even if you choose to stay with email, it is up to you to let people know when and where you will be available. If you're busy right now, or if you plan to be traveling, then you're not available to reply or participate. This means you need to let people know this. You have to manage their expectations to counter this ever-rising bar. There are many ways you can do this. You can get proactive and you can send out updates to those who are most likely to want to talk to you. Let them know the times that you will be available and when you will not be available. Give them access to your online calendar. Make sure to mark your busy times as busy and your available times as available. If you use a collaborative environment, then update your status and train your people to observe your status and availability notifications. This is a skill. It's part of the skill set called influence in which you get people to act in ways you would like, using positive emotion and positive reward. 
A related and equally vital skill is that of following up. If you promise to be available at a certain time, then you need to ensure that you are. If you promise to return all emails and calls by the end of the day, then you need to ensure that you can make the time to do that. People will believe in you and will accept these alternatives if they know they will be looked after within a reasonable amount of time. But if you break that promise, then the trust relationship will also be broken. So the power is within you to manage this ever-rising bar of expectations, those you have of yourself with regard to workload and achievement, and those that others have of you. It all depends on your ability to hone those soft skills of influence, planning, delegation, negotiation, and prioritization, and to use them daily as part of your overall practice. So, there you have it. My podcast on the rising bar of expectations and what you can do about it. A list of all of our podcasts and their related blogs is available at steveprentice.com under the Podcasts tab. You can also drop me a line through the contact form on that same website. And if you wish to, you can follow me on Twitter at Stephen Prentice, S-T-E-V-E-N-P-R-E-N-T-I-C-E. If you want to learn more, I do have a line of online learning resources in these essential soft skills, and you can find out more about that at the website under the Words tab. And by the way, if you are looking for an entertaining keynote speaker for your company's next event, I have a humorous one called Not Secure, which pokes fun at the whole range of workplace and technology challenges that we all encounter. You can find out more about that as well at steveprentice.com. So, until next time, I am Steve Prentice. Thank you for listening.